Hi, so in this video, we're going to be talking about something called Markov's inequality. Uh, so in here, we're actually going to start off going back directly to indicator functions. Um, and so for indicator functions, we basically remember that we just take the sum um, of the indicators to get the expected value, right? We just looked at all the sum and that basically gave us what we wanted. Um, and so the question is, how do we know that if our sum of indicators is itself an indicator? So this might seem a little weird, um, but the question basically becomes is like, okay, if I have a sum of indicators, how do I know that this itself is an indicator function or not? And remember an indicator function. Um, so let, let's kind of set up the scene a little bit. Um, what we end up having um, is we're going to have some random variables. So here be a bunch of events. Um, and we let i1 to in be the indicator functions for this event. And so what we're asking is, so remember that, um, so if, a, if xi occurs, then i1 is equal to 1, right? This is how indicator functions work. And if xi does not occur, then we get i1 <coughs> is equal to 0. Um, and so if we think about it, an indicator function really has only 0 or 1 as a value. So if we look at the sum, so here we have a sum, right? The sum is an indicator function if the value is always 0 or 1, right? Um, and that's just the definition of it. Um, and so what we have is since each of these i1s can only have value 0 or 1, what we're basically saying is that this is an indicator function if exactly one of these i1s, um, so maybe I should write this a little down. So it's an indicator function if exactly one of these i1s, you know, the one and everything else else is equal to zero, right? Because in that case, the sum becomes one and we have to have it equal one or zero. So either everything is zero or exactly one of these is equal to zero. So what happens in that case, what that means is all of these events, right? So if we think about all of the events, I can't have two of these events happen at one time ever, right? If, cause if any of two of these events happen at one time, then I get two ones um, and we get a problem. Um, and so what this means is each of these events are mutually exclusive. In other words, no two events can happen at the same time. Um, so what we have is uh, no two events can happen at the same time. Uh, and what we end up getting um, is something uh, fairly nice. So we get the following kind of um, equality. We have that um, the probability of all of the um, events, right? So if I take the union of all the events, um, i is equal to 1 to the n, uh, then this is going to be equal to the sum of all the probabilities, right? And this is definitely kind of weird. It's a weird idea. But basically what I'm saying, if I take all the events together, then I can just sum up um, all the probabilities because they're all mutually exclusive. Um, and now the question then becomes, okay, well, what happens if I take away this mutually con uh, Mutual, uh, this mutually exclusive principle. And I say, okay, say that they're not mutually exclusive. Well, we know that some of these events might happen at the same time, which means our probability is actually going to be less than this sum. Um, and that's what's known as Boole's inequality. Um, so Boole's inequality is given by uh, the following. So we have the same thing as above. Uh, let me see if this works this time. If I take this. Yes, let me copy. Uh, how do I paste now? Do I just hold? Nope. They changed the way this works. So I don't know where the uh, paste button is now. Uh, so what we have is... Um, this here. So we end up getting something less. Um, uh, 
Uh, and that's basically it. Uh, and so this idea here is actually going to give us, uh, we can actually take it a little uh, further, right? So notice how uh, this from this inequality by looking at the indicator functions, we know the thing on the right, well, these are just trues or falses, right? They're, we can look at them from an indicator perspective. Um, and we know the thing on the right here, this is just equal uh, to EI, right? It's just the sum of all the indicator functions. Um, or no, sorry. Uh, if I were to look at this from an indicator function perspective, right? Um, and I put in indicator functions, what do we get? On the right-hand side, I have EI, right? So this is just the sum of the P of II, right? We just sum over everything. Um, I is equal to one over N. And on the right-hand side, if I were to put the union of all these indicator functions, um, I equals one to N, um, well, this is just going to be the fact that um, I is greater than or equal to one, right? Um, in other words, some events, like there's going to be something in here, right? There's um, there's going to be at least one thing uh, or else we have not, we have empty events, which makes no sense. Um, and so from um, Bull's inequality, what we end up having is this less than or equal to. Uh, and so like this is kind of weird to look at, but this actually allows us to generalize um, into what's called Bull, um, Markov's inequality. So Markov's inequality, it's basically looking at what we just did um, and looking at it for an arbitrary thing. So if we let x um, be greater than or equal to 0, then what we have is we have the probability that x is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to the expected value of x divided by a. Uh, and this is true for every a, for every a greater than 0. So notice how the way we're doing this um, is we kind of take this expected i right here. And that gives us the expected value x here. This p of i is equal to greater than or equal to 1 comes here, but this 1 here becomes an a. And that's why here we're dividing by a. Um, and here, here you can kind of think of this as dividing by 1. So on the right-hand side, we end up getting divided by a. Um, so yeah, so what we'll do is we'll stop here. Uh, no, actually, the next example is quick. So we'll do this example, and we'll end it. Uh, for this. Uh, so let's look at an example of how this might work um, to helping us figure out probabilities. So say I have um, this example here. We have a non-negative random variable. So remember, x has to be non-negative, right? It has to always be greater than or equal to zero for Markov's inequality to work. Um, and we know its expected value is equal to five. Uh, so what do we have? We have um, x, oops, um, we have x is greater than 0, greater than or equal to 0, and we know the expected value of x is equal to 5. What is the largest probability of success that p of x greater than 100 can be? So the probability that x is greater than or equal to 100, well, this is, by Markov, less than or equal to the expected value divided by 100, right? So this is where our a comes in. This is our a. So we have to divide by a. Uh, and so what is this? This is 5 over 100. So we get 1 over 20. So that means at most, uh, p of x greater than or equal to 100 could be 1 over 20. We have no idea what this probability distribution is. And that's what's really strong about Markov's inequality. We have no idea what this distribution is. And it's basically saying no matter what the distribution is, there's some hard limit as to what the probability can be. In this case, we have a 1 in 20 chance. So 5% max, period. I don't care what the distribution is. It's a max of 5%. If I know the expected value is 5, over 100 is max of 5%. That's, that's a pretty strong thing. At least for me, that seems really strong. 
Um, okay, so we will stop um, this uh, video here. Uh, and in the next video, we're going to be talking about multiplication moments. Uh, this is a pretty fun topic. At least it's, it's cool for me uh, just because of the name. Uh, but yeah, so I will see you um, there. So see you in the next video.